normally we run to the circus, and I ran away. I was thinking about the theme of disruption, and I couldn't find the right way to present this talk. I've given many talks before, but this one I wasn't having an easy time with. So I was having a few drinks with a friend of mine. He's a civil engineer in、uh, Macau, and as you may know, Macau is going through a very tumultuous time right now. They're building casinos like viruses. But we were discussing, and he was explaining to me his fears and anxieties of the life career that he's going through and the、uh, decisions that he's making in his life. And that got me to thinking. In the circus, there are three things that are really hard to do every night: tightrope, juggling, and clowning. Why is that so、uh, so difficult? It's because when you learn the general mechanics of the physical body, you can come on stage and perform your act every night. Except for these three disciplines. They require constant adaptation. The balls don't always fall in the same spot. You have a general pattern, but you always have to be awake. Tightrope. It's the internal balance and consciousness. It's always being changed by lights, by stress, drinking too much the night before. <laughs> These things will all affect that slight element of, of balance that you have. And clowning, because you're always reacting to the audience. You're in this constant dialogue. And when I thought about this more. And I explained to him not to worry so much. It's the difference between reacting and rapidly adapting. Reacting. Hey, rapidly adapting. Right? How is that any different in business? If the curve has already happened and you're reacting to it, you're chasing a curve. If you feel something coming, oh look at that! There's disruption. All right, how do we adapt? How many of you have been in a meeting and never been bored? Raise your hand. Okay, obviously it doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> how many of you have been in a meeting and been completely and utterly bored? Raise your hand. Right, keep your hands there. Now, how many of you have gone into a meeting, had to speak, and been? Worried, unsure. Very few hands went down. Okay, you can put your hands down now. And those of you who didn't participate, thank you anyway. <laughs> That was the participation part of the moment. You're okay now. Don't worry. So this idea of、um, being bored and being fearful. This is a fear of change. Yeah, fearful, fear of change, boredom. I left the Cirque du Soleil. I was making very good money, had a good job, but I realized if I stayed, I'd just be a clown at Cirque du Soleil. It's a nice career, but I knew something else was happening. I went back to my master teacher. This man. He has a very simple method: go on stage. If we laugh, you stay. If you're boring, you sit down immediately. And if you're beautiful, someone who smiles genuinely is beautiful. And so he will go. You let you go on stage, and he'll stand there with a drum, and he'll give you maybe ten seconds, twenty seconds. Boom! Adios. Sit down immediately. And then he'll start to raise his arm, and you'll see. Oh, oh, it's coming! It's coming! So you have to change quickly. Change. Do something different. Boom! Sit down immediately. And this went on for a while. And of course, students get into a tunnel. They don't know anymore what to do. This can go on for months. And one day I was having a hard time for a while now. I was doing pretty bad. And he says, "Yesko, you're too clean." I said, "What do you mean I'm too clean? I'm a well-respected circus artist. I've done circus most of my life. I'm a clown. Every night, 2,500 people love me. I'm okay." He says, "No, no, no. You're cheating. Cheating. You're too clean. You know what you're going to do, but every next step, when you go on stage or go to try, be messy." Don't worry about being right anymore, huh? It took me five years to get that message properly. Five years, and so now I don't worry about being bad. I don't worry about being wrong. So I'd like to share with you three tools about being boring and adapting. Yes? Okay. Rule number one. Well, not rule number one. Question was. Before I go into that, I was here at Cirque, so I was quite successful. This was the House of Dancing Water, and then you can see the show is very good and very successful. 
That's my girlfriend. That's me. And so I was there and I left. I did my MBA and now I'm working at the Sans China Group and I'm working in a place which most people would consider hell. But I have another way to attack it. Rule number one. When you go into the business office, usually we think, okay, yes, because going there, they're going to think, oh, no, 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 it's going to be uh, something creative, and here comes the clown, and he's going to be in the business office. They think that I'm like that, or that I'm like this. Actually, that's Richard Branson. <laughs> no. What I do is I talk about this. That's a cliche. Creativity is a big word. How do we unpack it? Somebody much more intelligent than me said this. Creativity is intelligence having fun. That obviously is Albert Einstein. And now when I start thinking about this and I start thinking about creativity, what is creativity really? Intelligence having fun, what is it really? I came to this idea. Have intuition in your structure and structure your intuition. I'll explain. Robert Weisberg in his book on creativity, one of the great theorists on creativity, gives this nice case study. Um, DNA double helix. On your left, as many of you know, is Guernica from Picasso. Now, we say scientists discover and artists create. Well, not necessarily so. This woman, Rosalind Franklin, some of you may or may not know, she was a scientist around the same time as the discovery of DNA, and she created this radio um, X-ray of DNA. In fact, this woman was very close to discovering DNA. She discovered it. Only these guys found the model and got the paper in quicker. These guys, Watson and Crick, what they were doing is they were going on invisible hunches. They had the papers of Rosalind, and they had the work of others. But what they were doing is they were moving in the space of unknown. If this means this, then that could mean that. If this means this, then that could mean that. And so they were using intuition. They had a structured environment. They were going intuitively in their states. Now, Guernica. Picasso didn't sit in his studio and say, all right, I am a master. I will create a masterpiece. He didn't do that. What he did is he created 36 compositional studies before even making one tableau. And in fact, if you look carefully, he stole from other artists. In the top right-hand corner, you see the hands like this? That was taken from an expression from one of the paintings of Francisco Goya. The Minotaur on the opposite side of the painting, that's a theme from uh, Spanish mythology and Greek mythology, of course, and it was something that Picasso was working on all the time. Many of these elements he was working on all the time. And here you can see compositional sketches that he did. So, when we say that artists create and scientists discover, if we go on the spectrum of pure creation, God created the heavens and the earth, and discovering a $1 bill or a one euro bill on the ground, those two polarities, science and art, exist in between. And that is called creativity. So when someone tells you they're not creative, I say, bullshit. Creativity is a state of mind. It's being playfully curious with the world around you. That's creativity. So don't let anybody tell you they're not creative. They are. They just don't have the state of mind. Because we're, we all are. Next. Here's an example of me in, uh, in, Salt, in Cirque du Soleil. And I want to show you it. This is from the, from the show. It's my own act. I'll just show it. I'll explain it later. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, thank you for the applause. Ten years later, it still works. Okay, so this moment is very interesting. It's because when I'd be at the door here, stuck at the door, and then I'd see the water. So door, water, <gasps> reaction, boom, audience. Yeah, that moment sometimes would not get a laugh, and I didn't know why. I'd have to go back in the tapes. I'd have to watch video very carefully and break it down. Door, reaction, here, boom. And what was happening, I was doing tan, 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 too fast, or I would, the timing was off, and I'd have to be very structured in my the studying of what I was doing so that when I came back on stage, I could let it go and just flow. Yeah? Structure in your intuition and have intuition in your structure. Parallel thinking. When we're creating together, we're collaborating. Big groups. People will have one of four methodologies of thinking. They will either butt heads and argue, or they will be very American and say, let's agree to disagree. Great, disparate thinking, everybody's off on their own. Or we get the other thing, which is group think. Yes, boss, yes, boss, whatever you say, boss. So there's no real creativity happening, no real thinking going on. Or there's another way, parallel thinking, where you stay on your center and the other person stays on theirs, metaphorically speaking, and you look at the common problem together and you start bouncing ideas off one another, which is known as mental jazz. You play your side, I play my side. It becomes a yes and. And there we can start to build on each other's ideas. So when we consciously go on this idea of parallel thinking, tacking a problem together, focusing on the issue, it's different. Here is an example of the creation of the House of Dancing Water. When I work with a director, I watch what he's watching. I say, what is he doing? How can I respond to his proposal? What is his problem? I could stand in the center of the light, as in this image here, or whoop, I can go out of the light here, and I can give that space more power by looking at it, yeah? Working with a negative space. And so this is an example of parallel thinking. Next, intentional inhibition. When your phone rings or buzzes, you automatically go to it, right? When somebody calls your name, you turn right away and you say, oh, hey, what's up? This is a habit or an automatic response, right? The same thing happens in the creative world. Your boss or someone tells you to do something, you auto tend to automatically go and do it. Versus, you could receive the information, take a moment for yourself, say, no. Wait for a response to come, and then say yes. Because you've allowed yourself to resonate with the information. The space between receiving stimuli and reacting. Action, reaction, there's no humanity. Action, Wait, observe, then react. In that space, you're no longer reacting. You're responding, and you're responding as a human being. Here's an example, Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis. Herbie Hancock, great pianist, Miles Davis, of course, fantastic jazz mus musician, one of the greats of our 20th century. Herbie Hancock was playing with the microphones under his piano and came back during a song and pressed on the keys and made a mistake. And he said, oh, no, Miles Davis is going to hate me. Miles Davis heard it and then modulated his song to fit that sound. He never saw it as a mistake. He was in that state of rapid adaptation. Received information, didn't react, what are you doing? That wasn't what I was thinking. He listened, and then he responded. So now, I come now and I work with corporate clients. I work, I do give workshops. I'm working in human resources. And what I'm doing is, I'm teaching people again, or helping them discover again, or helping them create their sense of play, their creativity, their childhood. What I'm doing now as a brand advisor at the Sands, I'm taking the whole idea of the brand and trying to filter it into the human beings and say, how do we as human beings not live that brand, but how does it resonate with us? So in that service-based culture, when somebody comes, they live and experience that brand with us. And I'm find, how, finding how to do that with many human beings together. So it doesn't matter if I'm working with artists or with corporate clients. So, why did I run away from the circus? I ran away because ever since I was a child, I wanted to be a performer. I achieved it. I got good at it. It started to become automatic. Something needed to change. I felt it. Four weeks ago, I found out I'm going to be a father. 
Thank you very much, but don't applaud. That was the easy part. <laughs> but why do I bring that up? It's because I want to be fully present. And I'm not going to react. I'm going to rapidly adapt. So the question is, in our business lives, are we going to be reacting or rapidly adapting? Thank you. <laughs>